Hello and welcome to another episode of Reading Together from Seaharp Press. I'm Eugene Lunning, co-founder of Seaharp, and today we'll be continuing our journey through C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. In this episode, we're actually going to be finishing book two from within this work, and we'll be in chapter five, which is entitled The Practical Conclusion. The perfect surrender and humiliation were undergone by Christ. Perfect because he was God, surrender and humiliation because he was man. Now, the Christian belief is that if we somehow share the humility and suffering of Christ, we shall also share in his conquest of death and find a new life after we have died and in it become perfect and perfectly happy creatures. This means something much more than our trying to follow his teaching. People often ask when the next step in evolution, the step to something beyond man, will happen. But in the Christian view, it has happened already. In Christ, a new kind of man appeared, and the new kind of life which began in him is to be put into us. Oh, this is so good. And I have to stop already. Because in my own uh, church fellowship that I get the chance to lead with my wife, just this last Sunday, we were meditating on the realities of suffering as they were born by the early church. We specifically were looking at Acts 5, where it says that they went out from the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name. And our group just spent time pondering on what does it show people of the kingdom when we go through tremendous trials, or even little problems that we're struggling with, and actually deal with them in the joy of the Lord. This was our conclusion, that as we look at our issues, whether it's an unexpected bill or you're losing someone you love, when you look right at it, and then you offer to him your gratitude that he is with you in it, and when you still continue to strive to have his joy in the midst of your trials, friends, that is the new life. I like Lewis's question here. When will the next step of evolution begin? Well, it's begun. It's for those who live already in the kingdom that is an interior kingdom, a place where his spirit is the atmosphere of the way. So I'm stirred up already as we get into the practical conclusion of this book. I'll keep reading. How is this to be done? Now, Please remember how we acquired the old, ordinary kind of life. We derived it from others, from our father and mother and all our ancestors, without our consent, and by a very curious process involving pleasure, pain, and danger. A process you would never have guessed. Most of us spend a good many years in childhood trying to guess it. And some children, when they are first told, do not believe it. And I'm not sure that I blame them, for it is very odd. Now, the God who arranged that process is the same God who arranges how the new kind of life, the Christ life, is to be spread. We must be prepared for it being odd, too. He did not consult us when he invented sex. He has not consulted us either when he invented this. There are three things that spread the Christ life to us. Baptism, belief, and that mysterious action which different Christians call by different names. Holy Communion, the Mass, the Lord's Supper. At least, those are the three ordinary methods. I am not saying there may not be special cases where it is spread without one or more of these. I have not time to go into special cases, and I do not know enough. If you are trying in a few minutes to tell a man how to get to Edinburgh, Edinburgh, you will tell him the trains. He can, it is true, get there by boat or by a plane, but you will hardly bring that in. And I am not saying anything about which of these three things is the most essential. My Methodist friend would like me to say more about belief and less in proportion about the other two. But I am not going into that. Anyone who professes to teach you Christian doctrine will, in fact, tell you to use all three. And that is enough for our present purpose. 
And if you've watched any of these series, you know that I am absolutely delighted when I stop and pause and think about, just as I did in Acts 5, the life of the early church. So I know that Lewis is infinitely more brilliant than me, but I would actually argue with Lewis on that last paragraph. He says that there are three things that spread the Christ life to us. Baptism, belief, and that mysterious action of what you and I would call communion, mass, or the Eucharist. Boy, do I think he's left something out. Because before the early church went out baptizing, you might remember a certain day when 3,000 were baptized into belief. And before they had even the idea of a true sacrament called the Eucharist or communion, friends, what came before all of that? What is the great spreader of the Christ life? The Holy Spirit. So I think Lewis has a little overshot himself here by saying that those are the three, when in fact all three of those flow from the early churches and now our experience of the Holy Spirit. And I don't think I'm being overly charismatic, someone who's just all about the Pentecostal ways. I don't think that's an arguable point. The Holy Spirit is in fact the nexus, the place by which the Christ life enters into our frail human lives. So, Lewis... You're fabulous, but I think you left something out there. I'll keep reading. I cannot myself see why these things should be the conductors of the new kind of life. But then, if one did not happen to know, I should never have seen any connection between a particular physical pleasure and the appearance of a new human being in the world. We have to take reality as it comes to us. There is no good jabbering about what it ought to be like or what we should have expected it to be like. But though I cannot see why it should be so, I can tell you why I believe it is so. I have explained why I have to believe that Jesus was and is God. And it seems plain as a matter of history that he taught his followers that the new life was communicated in this way. In other words, I believe it on his authority. Do not be scared by the word authority. Believing things on authority only means believing them because you have been told them by someone you think trustworthy. 99% of the things you believe are believed on authority. I believe there is such a place as New York. I have not seen it myself. I could not prove by abstract reasoning that there must be such a place. I believe it because reliable people have told me so. The ordinary man believes in the solar system, atoms, evolution, and the circulation of the blood on authority because the scientists say so. Every historical statement in the world is believed on authority. None of us has seen the Norman conquest or the defeat of the Armada. None of us could prove them by pure logic as you prove a thing in mathematics. We believe them simply because people who did see them have left writings that tell us about them, in fact, on authority. A man who jibbed at authority and other things, as some people do in religion, would have to be content to know nothing all his life. And I love that he takes us back there to the reality that this is simply what Jesus has said about the way that his own life is going to be communicated to his generations to follow. And I love the act, this discussion of the word authority because more than once, it talks about how people marveled at Jesus' authority. The Greek word is exousia. They were sort of staggered by it, blown away by it. But then I also love when in Matthew 28, the famous Great Commission, Jesus says, all authority, exousia, has been given to me. And then he says that great therefore. Therefore, because I hold the authority, you are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So friends, the authority of Jesus that was so clear to those who were around him is what he handed, not just to those apostles in some apostolic succession kind of way, but because those were his friends. And this is a wild thought, but are you ready for it? You are his friend. He has chosen you. You have had an experience in your life where you have brought your human will to say, yes, Jesus, I would be yours. Please free me, save me. But in so doing, my friend, you became his disciple. In fact, even his apostle, a sent one. And so where does that therefore send you? 
It sends you out into all the world to make disciples using what? His authority. So this very chain of command that Lewis is talking about, that authority that we believe naturally about, say, George Washington, well, friends, let's believe it all the more as we believe what Jesus has said about how he would like to communicate his life to us day by day by day. I'll keep reading. Do not think I am setting up baptism and belief and the Holy Communion as things that will do instead of your own attempts to copy Christ. Your natural life is derived from your parents. That does not mean it will stay there if you do nothing about it. You can lose it by neglect or you can drive it away by committing suicide. You have to feed it and look after it. But always remember you are not making it. You are only keeping up a life you got from someone else. What a beautiful turn of phrase. In the same way, a Christian can lose the Christ life which has been put into him, and he has to make efforts to keep it. But even the best Christian that ever lived is not acting on his own steam. He is only nourishing or protecting a life he could never have acquired by his own efforts. And that has practical consequences. As long as the natural life is in your body, it will do a lot towards repairing that body. Cut it, and up to a point it will heal as a dead body would not. A live body is not one that never gets hurt, but one that can to some extent repair itself. In the same way, a Christian is not a man who never goes wrong, but a man who is enabled to repent and pick himself up and begin over again after each stumble because the Christ life is inside him, repairing him all the time, enabling him to repeat in some degree the kind of voluntary death which Christ himself carried out. It reminds me there's a great turn, a great moment within the book of Romans. I'm sorry, not, it's not Romans. Where am I thinking now? Let me think for a moment. It's in Colossians 1, where it talks about how we have been reconciled by his death on the body, of his body on the cross. And then it has this great moment. It says, this reconciliation assumes, of course, that we maintain a per firm position in the faith and do not allow ourselves to be shifted away from the hope of the gospel. That's what Lewis is talking about here. Sorry for my bobble on Romans 8. Colossians 1. Those are a couple of my favorite chapters. Sometimes they blend with each other in my head. But friends, the reconciliation that has occurred, and what is reconciliation is to be reconciliated, to be brought back into relationship. The way that the separation that existed through all time between God and man, the way it has been reconciled by Jesus is a permanent reconciliation. But then I love that phrase there. This reconciliation assumes, of course, that you maintain a firm position in the faith and do not allow yourselves to be shifted away from the hope of the gospel. Again, that's what Lewis is talking about. Just because you are the son and daughter of some, uh, you know, wonderful husband and wife, that doesn't necessarily mean that you go through the rest of your life sort of under the covering of that if you just choose to be completely opposite of it. So, I'm not talking here about like backsliding and losing your faith. I'm just saying what Lewis says about repenting again after each stumble, knowing that the Christ life is within us, repairing us at every turn. Friends, that's our reality. That is, in fact, the hope of that gospel that we are meant to cling to. So no matter what kind of day you're having today, whether you want to get into some theological argument or you haven't thought about this for a second until you started watching this episode, I remind you that in our follies, in the way that we fall short, our job, first and foremost, when we catch ourselves, oh, that's not what Jesus is like, is to stop and repent, to turn again back to him and say, oh, Jesus, you are the Christ. Your Christ life by your spirit lives in me. Would you make me new again? Would you set me free of that mistake I just made in your sight? And would you help me to do what you want me to do now? and for the rest of this day. Just this morning, I was being refreshed again by what he said when he said, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Friends, that is just as true with our anxiety as it is with our sin. The ways we fall short, let's just focus on right now. Let's repent. Let's follow him, and when we fall short again, we'll repent again.
This is not cheapening of grace, friends. This is actually making use of the grace that he is offering us freely and lavishly. I'll keep reading. That is why the Christian is in a different position from other people who are trying to be good. They hope, by being good, to please God, if there is one, or if they think there is not, at least they hope to deserve approval from good men. But the Christian thinks any good he does comes from the Christ life inside him. He does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. Just as the roof of a greenhouse does not attract the sun because it is bright, but becomes bright because the sun shines on it. And let me make it quite clear that when Christians say the Christ life is in them, they do not mean simply something mental or moral. When they speak of being in Christ or of Christ being in them, this is not simply a way of saying that they are thinking about Christ or copying him. They mean that Christ is actually operating through them, that the whole mass of Christians are the physical organism through which Christ acts, that we are his fingers and muscles, the cells of his body. And perhaps that explains one or two things. It explains why this new life is spread not only by purely mental acts like belief, but by bodily acts like baptism and Holy Communion. It is not merely the spreading of an idea. It is more like evolution, a biological or super biological fact. There is no good trying to be more spiritual than God. God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. That is why he uses material things like bread and wine to put the new life into us. We may think this rather crude and unspiritual. God does not. He invented eating. He likes matter. He invented it. Oh, I love this. And I love how Lewis and another of my friends, J.B. Phillips, they're so playful with the way that they remind us that God is in fact wondrously humorous. In fact, look at yourself if you want an example. We're funny little people. We live these funny little lives and we have to eat. We need to get a little exercise. We are kind of a funny creature to observe. But I want to just go back for a minute because in the paragraph before that, I was so caught. Oh, this is so good. We do not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. Friends, this idea, which really is the actual idea of sanctification, the making holy of us, it is accomplished by our intimate love relationship with God our Father. Jesus came to show us what it actually looks like. He was amongst us. He was one of us, yet without sin. But when we read the Gospels, that's the life we're intended to have. It's not so beyond us, so supernatural that he was like, you know, you're not ever going to have this. You're just going to struggle through life. And I'm not talking here about perfectibility. I'm simply saying that Jesus is, in fact, the second Adam, the new man, so that we would look as men and women at him and say, yeah, I'm going to have that. Now, how do I do it, Jesus? He says, well, let my life operate through, through you and within you. Friends, this is the plan. In fact, let's go back to Colossians 1 now that I remember Colossians 1 and say yet again, I've probably mentioned this in every single series, the mystery, the secret of the ages is simply this, Christ in you. Yes, Christ in you, bringing with him the hope of all the glorious things to come. So friends, let's give ourselves over to the Christ life, to the way of Jesus, to that Holy Spirit, which is his spirit, that he's already given us. I mean, this is as glorious and simple as A, B, C. One plus one equals two. Let's just go do it. Let's let him do it in us. Here is another thing that used to puzzle me. Is it not frightfully unfair that this new life should be confined to people who have heard of Christ and been able to believe in him? But the truth is God has not told us what his arrangements about the other people are. We do know that no man can be saved except through Christ. We do not know that only those who know him can be saved through him. But in the meantime, if you are worried about the people outside, 
the most unreasonable thing you can do is to remain outside yourself. Christians are Christ's body, the organism through which he works. Every addition to that body enables him to do more. If you want to help those outside, you must add your own little cell to the body of Christ who alone can help them. Cutting off a man's finger would be an odd way of getting him to do more work. Now this right here is a real subtle dip into this conversation, we've already talked about it, between Arminianism and Calvinism, between this idea of predestination and free will. But I've made this argument to you before, and I'll make it one more time. If you are a staunch Calvinist, let me remind you what you don't know. Who else has been chosen? So if you are one of those folks and you feel very safely inside of the body, well, guess what? Get outside. Go looking for those other ones who perhaps are chosen and you're the vehicle for them to get inside as chosen ones. Now, if you are somebody who believes that it was your own free will, your own choice to choose Jesus, to be set free by a choice to come to him, well, what should you do? Well, replicate yourself. Go out and make sure that every single person that you encounter has an encounter with him. I'll give an example. This morning, I got home from dropping off my kids at school, walked into the house, walked back out into the garage, and realized, oh gracious, there is a huge oil slick coming into my garage from under my truck. Oh no, I drive an old Toyota Tacoma. Love that truck, but it's getting old. So what did I need to do and swiftly get it to the mechanic? Well, how do you feel when you have a huge repair coming? I drove over feeling a little nervous, a little anxious. But the minute I got to that mechanic's, you know, inside office, I could tell that the lady who runs the office, the office manager, was having a fairly stressful day. And in that split second, I'm so thankful to the Christ life within me. I just shifted gears. I just thought, you know what? No matter how much this costs, who cares? The Lord will provide. And I thought, it's time to really try and love this lady, Kim, who's behind the desk. And so for me this morning, that was the practical ramifications of having this Jesus, having either chosen or let me come to him. I tried as best I could to extend the kingdom this morning in that office. Friends, we can all do that in every situation, whether we have a huge truck repair bill coming or not. I challenge you. Why don't we show people how good this life with Jesus is rather than moping around as joyless Christians and expecting them to somehow get in through that portal? Boy, it doesn't look real attractive. Well, let's try it. Let's see how it goes on a day of your life. I'm trying today, and I'd love to meet you out there trying yourself. All right, last long paragraph of the end of book two, chapter five. Another possible objection is this. Why is God landing in this enemy-occupied world in disguise and starting a sort of secret society to undermine the devil? Why is he not landing in force, invading it? Is it that he is not strong enough? Well, Christians think he is going to land in force. We do not know when, but we can guess why he is delaying. He wants to give us the chance of joining his side freely. I do not suppose you and I would have thought much of a Frenchman who waited till the Allies were marching into Germany and then announced he was on our side. God will invade. But I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it is the end of the world. When the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade all right, but what is the good of saying you are on his side then, when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else, something it never entered your head to conceive comes crashing in, something so beautiful to some of us and so terrible to others that none of us will have any choice left. For this time, it will be God without disguise. Something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. There is no use saying you choose to lie down when it has become impossible to stand up. 
that will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen, whether we realized it before or not. Now today, this moment, is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. Friends, I want to remind you as we close out book two, chapter five, that what we are choosing as we step into the day and as we choose that side or the other, as he says, is not an ideology called Christianity, though that is in fact in the title and name of this book. What we are choosing is the God who chose to incarnate to show us his face. We are choosing the Christ, and the name of the Christ is Jesus of Nazareth. So my invitation to you every single day is that you and I would absolutely immerse ourselves in the Gospels. For myself this morning, before my car broke down, I was in John 6. And what a joy to see, even before I had that unexpected bill on my table, that he, in fact, is the one who takes five loaves, two fish, holds them up to heaven and says, Oh, thank you, Father, for I know what you can do with these. Friends, the more time we spend with Jesus, the more we fall in love with Jesus, the more we receive the love of Jesus, and the more we turn around love others and love him by loving others. So let's become enamored today with the opportunity that is ours to follow such a glorious Christ. Let's be the people with radiant eyes, radiant countenances, because we have already received the Christ life within. Thanks for joining me. We are, again to remind you, in Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. That was the fifth and final chapter of book two. I look forward to chapter one of book three in our next episode. Thanks for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.